So these are what's known as the Einstein field equations. You may have seen them, or you may haven't, and if you haven't, that's okay. Uh, but you could just say that they form essentially what is the bedrock of our classical understanding of how space-time is curved whenever matter is introduced into any certain space. You should say classical because general relativity truly is from the get-go a classical theory, right? There is no, um, you know, quantized description of gravity as of yet, and even general relativity is just a really, really good and really, really close approximation that works up until just a few notable instances, mainly black holes, right? When looking at the left side of the field equations, uh, what we have is the Einstein tensor. You may see it uh, just written as g mu nu. It's just shorthand. It firstly has that r mu nu. That's what's known as the Ricci tensor or the Ricci curvature tensor, it specifically defines the volume change along what are known as geodesics. A geodesic just being some curved path between any two points on a manifold and is a special contraction across one upper and one lower index of its big brother, the Riemann curvature tensor, which you may have actually heard of. The Riemann curvature tensor is the tool used to actually detect uh, curvature of space-time, the deviation of a vector, as it's what's called parallel transported across a manifold. And the reason, the real reason it's needed is because one of the features of our real space-time, one of the features of the real universe that we live in is that you, as an observer, can always zoom in and pick some infinitesimally small point on a manifold, like, I don't know, a tangent space, and make gravity disappear. Your connection coefficients would actually go to zero. This is the essence of the equivalence principle. If you're on, I don't know, a sphere like the Earth, the Earth seems to be a good example, um, you know, obviously the Earth is curved, the Earth is a sphere, but you, standing in your little local frame, you may see it to be flat. You may see your local frame to be flat, and you may see there to be no gravity. What you can say is that I have zoomed in far enough to where space-time is now flat here. I am now in a perfect Minkowski space, a perfectly flat space-time, and gravity has disappeared. So because of this, because you can do this, because an observer can do this, we need something to truly track the curvature of space-time, and that's what a Riemann tensor can do for us. Its components are given by this expression involving those connection coefficients, those capital gamma terms. The connection coefficients come about when you take what's called the covariant derivative of basis vectors in another coordinate direction, or the covariant derivative of a basis vector along another basis vector. Just think of it as a special way of taking a derivative in some specific direction. What you get, the resulting vector, can be expressed as an answer involving those connection coefficients. And in general, these connection coefficients can be given in terms of the metric on your space. The metric or the metric tensor defines your space because it's given in terms of the basis on your space. Um, we all remember from high school the XYZ coordinate plane. Essentially, you can think of that as a basis. And getting the connection coefficients in terms of that metric starts with getting the equation for the covariant derivative of the metric tensor, which is given by this which we can set this statement as equal to zero and then rearrange to get this. And once you perform three what are called cyclic permutations across the indices, you can subtract these terms from each other. And due to uh, what's called the no torsion rule and due to just the general symmetries of the metric tensor, four of these terms will cancel, while two will survive due to the distribution of that minus sign. Putting the pieces back together gives us this, which we can simplify even further by just dividing and moving this system to the other side, which flips the sign, giving us this. And once you contract with what's known as an inverse metric, we get a finished product of this. And this is known as the Christoffel symbols. And when it's given in terms of the metric on your space, like it obviously is here, it's called the levi chavita connection. This is what's being shown in the components of that original Riemann tensor expression. Now, as it's seen in the Einstein field equations, the components of the Ricci tensor, like I said, are, can be written as a contraction of the components of the Riemann tensor, or something like R, A, B, A, C. You can just contract those A's and get R, B, C. And to show why this extra stuff is added onto the Ricci tensor, you may wonder why not just use the Ricci tensor to show your geometry. Well, there's a symmetry on the Riemann tensor called the differential Bianchi identity. It works only in that local inertial frame that I mentioned. And it says that if you take the covariant derivative of the Riemann tensor three times in a different index direction, and if you cyclically permutate the last two bottom indices for each term, and then add all those terms together, you get zero. 
This is important, of course, when you note that the covariant divergence, which is basically the covariant derivative in a specific direction of the Ricci tensor is not zero. You don't get a zero divergence. So something like r mu nu in the direction of nu, you would not get zero for that. While the energy momentum tensor on the other side of the field equations, which describes the energy and mass content in some region of space, has a zero divergence. It, you get a zero divergence for the momentum tensor. So you can't just use the Ricci tensor to set curvature equal to energy because you're not getting the same divergence. So what the Ricci tensor requires is a modification to get a zero divergence so that you can set curvature equal to energy. You do this by first contracting these first two Riemann terms into Ricci tensors. The third is traditionally not messed with to do this. But after you contract and introduce an inverse metric in sum over b, and then contract setting i equal to d, you get the Ricci scalar for this term. The Ricci scalar, the uh, curvature scalar, it's just, it's just a contraction of the Ricci tensor when one of the Ricci tensor indices is raised. And once we set dummy indices equal to each other, we can combine, etc., and we can see that this combination of the Ricci tensor with a subtracted half-off Ricci curvature scalar with the metric gives a zero divergence. So now it can match up with the energy on the other side and now you can set curvature equal to mass or curvature equal to energy, whatever. But what about this term, okay? For, for the topic of this, Boltzmann brains, this term is really the only thing that matters, okay? It's uh, it's a lambda term. It's called a cosmological constant. Firstly, it is, of course, a constant, and we can add it to the Einstein equations without really change, without impacting the zero divergence, because you can always add a constant and not impact rate of change, right? You may hear it uh, referred to as an integration constant, okay, just to see that you have to add on to the end of integrals. It's because you can add it and really nothing happens. It's just a constant, but it's important. You'll see it either plus or minus, depending on the convention. Don't really worry about that. Let's just talk about what it is. We can start with Einstein uh, actually forming his general theory of relativity in the early 1900s. As he was in the midst of forming his first iteration of those field equations, Einstein was talking to prominent astronomers in the day, the rather early 1900s, and was really he was really probing them, and he was really wanting to know what was going on. He was really wanting to know what they were observing through through their telescopes. And what really sets all of this up, what was really the catch for all of this, was that they at this time, the astronomical, uh, the astronomical, the astronomical and cosmological communities, at this time they still believed what was known as the static state model of the universe. They still believed, and this was mainly due to technological limitations, but they still believed that the universe had no notable beginning and that it would have no notable end, that the universe macroscopically was just static and there wasn't really much going on. And like I said, this was mainly caused due to technological limitations, but another big factor was that um, at this time, it was not known for sure, but was being theorized that there were other galaxies in the universe besides the Milky Way and separate from the Milky Way. It was now being theorized that things like these spiral nebula, these faint spiral nebula that we're observing in the sky may actually be completely separate from anything we observe in our local region. They may be completely separate from the Milky Way galaxy. And the name given to these proposed entities in light of these theories being built upon, island universes, which is a particularly beautiful name in my opinion. But eventually through observations, it was confirmed for sure that there were in fact other galaxies in the universe. But as for the expansion of the universe, never mind the accelerated expansion, it was a discovery that couldn't come soon enough. When Einstein presented the first iteration of his field equations, a problem arose right off the bat, which was that the predictions of his equations were not fitting the empirical observations of the time. It was not fitting what the communities were seeing through their telescope. Even though the true nature of those spiral nebula were on the verge of discovery and the uh, the minds of the astronomical and cosmological communities were about to be blown wide open, it was still believed that the universe as a whole was static. The static state model, the static state cosmological model was still the norm. Einstein's equations were actually predicting that if the universe was truly chill, like the static state model was predicting, that all matter in the universe, everything, would eventually collapse in on itself into a singular black hole. This was obviously very strange, right? The equations were saying that everything was doomed to a black hole, 
but all of the astronomers were saying that we're in a static state, that nothing really notable is even happening in the universe. So Einstein actually issues a correction. This is correction number one, and it comes in 1917. In order to get rid of the predictions that everything collapses into black holes, in order to conform with the empirical observations of the so-called static state, Einstein adds a cosmological constant, a lambda term, and multiplies it by the metric g mu nu. It was presented actually as a repulsive force, okay, and it was necessary. Everything is supposed to, the, the equations are predicting that everything collapses in. Well, if you add just a constant repulsive force that keeps everything in the static state and it keeps it conforming with the empirical observations in the static state model of the time. Of course, like I said, it wasn't correct, but it wasn't known at the time. And as all this is going on, different solutions are actually being cooked up for these field equations. A theory is introduced for a positive cosmological constant with no traditional matter in the space, just a vacuum energy that's called the sitter space. And likewise, another um, solution was presented by a Russian man named Alexander Friedman called the Friedman Equations. It's a solution for the expanding universe with an actual energy density, not a vacuum, like something like the sitter space. But this is where it really gets interesting because in the year 1929, Hubble actually comes back and says, hey, these newly found spiral nebula, these newly found galaxies, right, that we're observing, what we're seeing is that their light actually appears to be more and more redshifted the farther they are away. The farther these galaxies are from the Milky Way, the faster they appear to be going. It's not like everything is expanding at a uniform rate. In fact, it appears that everything is expanding at a rate of 70 meters per second per megaparsec. Hubble found the relationship between the distance of the galaxy from the Milky Way and its apparent speed. And this is now expressed in what's known as Hubble's Law. Um, you'll normally just see it as V equals dh naught, where V, the velocity of a galaxy relative to us, is equal to d, the distance, times h naught, which is called Hubble's constant, okay? It can connect the distance to the velocity. That's the expansion rate. That's the 70 meters per second per megaparsec. You could also show the Hubble constant in terms of what's known as the scale factor, A. The scale factor relates the distance between two what are called co-moving frames of reference as time goes on. Co-moving meaning that they are connected to the actual expansion of the universe. As the universe expands, these co-moving frames move perfectly um, you know, with it. The movement with respect to time can be described through the scale factor, but that's not really pressing for the nature of this video. So we'll just stick with something like V equals DH naught. This seems to be fine for us. So since it's now known that the universe is expanding, the static state model that was accepted for so many years is now completely dead. And this comes right at the end of the Roaring Twenties in 1929. So Einstein actually decides to pull the cosmological constant. It's seen as no longer needed. Remember, in these field equations, the static state was not the norm, right? The cosmological constant, the repulsive force, had to be first added in in order to bring about the static state. But the field equations were always predicting some type of dynamical movement. They had to be added upon to not have that movement. But since Hubble has just found, among other things, that the universe is expanding and that that expansion is stacking, there's no need for that cosmological constant anymore. You don't need that repulsive force. Their field equations were only predicting everything to collapse into a black hole if the universe had always been in the static state. So the cosmological constant was needed for the static state. But when you find that the universe is not in the static state, that it's expanding, you can just forget about the cosmological constant. You don't need the repulsive force anymore. But now, 70 years later, another stick has been tossed into the bicycle spokes of this whole thing, okay? Um, at the turn of the century, two international teams of researchers found that, hey, not only is the universe expanding, but that expansion itself is accelerating. So now, in order to explain not the expansion of the universe, but the accelerated expansion, the cosmological constant has been added back in, which is where it is uh, today, now. This is probably due to dark energy which is most likely the cosmological constant. It's not known for certain, but of course, that's, I guess that's really the only conclusion you could make is that whatever's causing this expansion and this accelerated expansion is the cosmological constant. 
but as for what underpins dark energy, we really don't know. Um, of course, different theories have been proposed, but when the numbers are ran, nothing actually even comes close to what the proposed value should be for what we observe. So we really have no idea as of right now. But anyways, we can apply this idea of the cosmological constant um, to the actual topic and to what I really want to talk about, which is Boltzmann brains. Okay, what even is a Boltzmann brain and how does it apply you know, to the accelerated expansion of the universe. Well, Boltzmann, the person whose name it takes, was trying to engage in an ongoing conversation at the time on recent advancements made in the field of statistical mechanics, and specifically in things like, you know, the different interpretations in, in, of entropy and the dynamics of both closed and really open systems, specifically entropy as it applies to the whole macroscopic universe. The textbook definition is the inability to convert thermal energy into work. And I don't really want to go into macro states or micro states for this. We can just think of entropy as the disorder within any type of system. Think of a hot and dense and rather small big bang as a very low entropy event. That's a very ordered, um, you know, very structured event. But on the flip side of that, think of like a piston or a compressed gas, okay? As you squeeze and compress the gas, the entropy gets lower and lower, of course, and there's more potential for work. But when you release, the piston shoots rapidly outward. The gas pressure is rapidly reduced, as well as the temperature, and the gas molecules and the gas get less and less dense. Think of this as a higher entropy event, okay? Things are now less and less organized, and there's now less of an ability to produce some type of work. That's higher entropy. What Boltzmann was trying to get at was a way to reconcile the different theories of how dynamical systems like the universe and systems within the universe acted as time went to infinity. You could call this proposed universe of his, what he was really trying to look at, a Boltzmann reconciliation universe, okay? And based on a theory that was present at the time, Boltzmann proposed that our universe was essentially just a void already at maximum entropy and that through uh, random downward fluctuations in entropy, which will happen in a finite amount of time, everything in existence came about. The stars, planets, and galaxies were all the result of just a random and massive dip in entropy from a void already at some maximum entropy state. This was how differing theories on the nature of entropy and the nature of dynamical systems could be reconciled as time went to infinity. And one of the main ideas in play here is that you're really only going to get something interesting uh, forming in between lower and higher entropy. You're really only going to get things like stars, planets, and galaxies somewhere in between. You wouldn't get them in an extremely organized and low entropy event, and you definitely wouldn't get them in an extremely high entropy event where there's no potential for work. It's going to be somewhere in the middle where the movement happens and where interesting things form. And since entropy is probabilistic, there will always be a non-zero chance that you'll get some random downward fluctuations in entropy. Of course, you would never really expect something like this to happen on a daily basis, but probabilistically, there's never a strictly zero chance that something like this could happen. You can say it is so unlikely that it will never happen in like the next billion years, but it's never a strictly zero chance. This is realized physically in the universe with an infinite timetable, with everything possible with a non-zero chance of occurring, eventually occurring in an infinite universe. But not just that, occurring in infinite amount of times. No matter how rare or improbable, it will at least occur in an infinite universe. In a universe infinite in time is to be more precise, but there's a problem with this universe of Boltzmann's, okay? And it's that surely you would sometimes, if you're at a max entropy state, surely you would sometimes get these random downward fluctuations, these large random downward fluctuations, which would form stars and planets and galaxies, things we see around us. But what you would get actually a lot more of the time, and what would actually be way more probable, and I mean way more probable, is tiny downward fluctuations in entropy from the void from thermal equilibrium, where not stars, planets, and galaxies are formed, but rather singular conscious observers in some form. Unembodied minds, a Boltzmann brain, okay? The Boltzmann brain paradox is the precise rebuttal to the Boltzmann reconciliation universe. By simple probability, we can say that it is exponentially more likely that a singular observer would uh, come into existence in this void rather than 
the expansive galaxies that we see around us. So one could make a pretty convincing argument for the fact that we do not live in a Boltzmann reconciliation universe, because if we did, the chances of everything, of you know, all the galaxies that we see around us just fluctuating into existence in an extremely large dip in entropy is so low that you can essentially rule it out by experiment. You can essentially say that we do not live in a reconciliation universe. But you have to separate, what's important for this is you have to, you have to separate the idea of a Boltzmann brain from the Boltzmann reconciliation universe because what we're about to talk about, what's actually grounded in reality, the sitter space, is actually a space where Boltzmann brains could come about and we may be headed for a Boltzmann reconciliation universe in the extremely far future even if we're not actually in one right now. So like I said, there's those two solutions to the field equations um, you, that we just talked about. There's the Friedman equations and the sitter space. Both of them we care about for this. The Friedman equation deals with the energy density of the universe and tells us what the expansion truly is in terms of the energy contained within. It gives us the scale factor, which I briefly mentioned. Uh, it gives us the scale factor and subsequently the Hubble constant. Remember the Hubble constant is that H naught and V equals dH naught. And the universe currently is in what's called a energy dominated phase or a dark energy dominated phase. And this makes sense. If you look at the statistics, 70% of the actual energy in the universe is dark energy. This phase began about 10 billion years after the Big Bang, and it's described through an energy, uh, <laughs> an energy momentum tensor. Remember, that's what's on the right side of the field equations. It's described uh, specifically through a perfect fluid energy momentum tensor. Um, we put two restrictions on the cosmological model, uh, isotropic and homogeneous, because that's what we observe. So when you impose those restrictions, what you actually get is um, a, a certain fluid that actually, it's a perfect fluid. So you can just call your momentum tensor a perfect fluid momentum tensor. There's also a dust momentum tensor um, for a previous phase in the universe, a matter dominated phase, call that a dust momentum tensor. But anyways, because of these two restrictions we put on our cosmological models, isotropic and homogeneous. Um, we use the FRW metric shown here. So the Friedman equation is normally given in a form similar to this, okay? And there's two things really going on here. There's K, uh, the curvature constant, and then there's rho, the energy density of whatever space you're looking at. And as for rho, it comes about from the time time, or the zero zero component of that energy momentum tensor. It's the density of all types of matter plus the energy of all relativistic particles like photons, all of that divided by some volume. Whatever, re whatever, um, whatever the volume of your space is, you combine uh, the energy of both photons and traditional matter, rad or radiation and matter, okay, and then divide that by some volume, that's your rho. And as for K, the curvature constant of the universe, although space-time curves due to matter, which I'm, you know, we all know that, right? Uh, matter tells space-time how to curve, whatever. Um, even though space-time is curved through matter, there's actually no reason to think that the universe is either plus one positively curved or minus one negatively curved on any macroscopic scale. So basically there was a probe that was launched, uh, I think it, it was in 2003, um, I don't have it written down, but I think it was, or no, two, yeah I do, 2001, called WMAP, which among other things was trying to help us find the overall curvature of the universe if it was curved on a macro scale and it was able to help us find that within a very small um, margin of error the universe is actually flat on a macroscopic scale so we can just forget about that k term in the equation and it's not really relevant in our universe and g on the right side that's just a newtonian gravitational constant and essentially all of either cosmology or general relativity it's just set equal to one so we don't really have to worry about that either as long as we annotate of course that it's set equal to one that's a very big deal so annotate it and then what you notice is that you can actually divide by three on both sides obviously and bring lambda to the other side which gives us this expression and remember that plus or minus really doesn't matter that much it's just a matter of convention and now this differentiated scale factor on, on the left side, okay, over the regular scale factor, that's just the Hubble constant. That's just the V equals dH naught, remember? So now we have, you know, that squared Hubble constant, but we can just take the square root of all terms, which gives us the standard regular Hubble constant, okay? 
but we're actually not done yet because this is where the Friedman equations actually predict the center space, the space we care about for Boltzmann brains. The energy density rho is the total energy of mass and radiation of the universe divided by some volume. Remember, it's a density. Rho equals E over V, okay? But what we've been talking about this whole video is that not only is space expanding, but the rate of the expansion is accelerating. We literally have a Hubble constant. So if space is expanding, that means what? It means your volume, the denominator in your row term, is getting larger. It's getting larger and larger. And actually, given an infinite amount of time, when t goes to infinity, that denominator goes to infinity as well. So that fraction equals zero. So as t progresses more and more and gets closer and closer to infinity, of course, it'll never touch, that fraction will never touch zero, but it's a limit, right? It approaches zero and gets closer and closer as time goes to infinity. Well, now this leaves you with a very simple space. It's a space whose only job is to be a vacuum and to just expand and keep expanding. It's called the sitter space, all right? The sitter space is predicted by the Friedman equations. It's a space defined by a cosmological constant with a vacuum energy density. And geometrically, the sitter space can just be thought of as a hyperboloid, as a constantly expanding sphere in one higher dimension. So if time is going up, each infinitesimal slice of the hyperboloid is itself a three-dimensional a three space. This is because as an empty space with only a cosmological constant, it has constant curvature. So it's not flat in any sense. So as time evolves, your space gets bigger. And this may seem weird at first. Of course, like I said, we've all seen that uh, saying, matter tells space how to curve, whatever. The Einstein field equations uh, say this. Well, for small scales, where you can forget about the cosmological constant, like uh, small scales like around the Earth, for example, think of like a satellite orbiting around the Earth something like that where there really is no need to worry about a cosmological constant we see that the energy momentum tensor with its constant is actually equivalent to the Einstein tensor on the left that tensor includes the Ricci scalar um, and the Ricci tensor as well of, of course the metric this characterizes the geometry of space-time you can see right here that mass gives you curvature in some sense everyone knows this but check this out all right this is pretty big even if you have no matter or no mass in your space and you set that whole right side equal to zero, you still have curvature in your desitter space even with no matter, all right? So energy momentum tensor goes to zero, which makes that constant go to zero. You can eliminate that, but then because you have a non-zero cosmological constant, you can bring the lambda term to the other side and you can see that your curvature for your space is actually equivalent to your cosmological constant. So the constant is giving your space curvature even if there's no matter. So you don't, this is a big thing, you don't need, you don't even need matter or energy in a space, or you don't need traditional matter in a space or traditional energy to curve space. Even a vacuum, a vacuum energy could curve space as well, all right? It doesn't have to be either traditional mass or photons. This is why the sitter space is shown as a hyperboloid. It's because even as an empty space, it has that constant curvature. So as time, <coughs> as time progresses, your space is constantly expanding. The Ricci tensor for de Sitter space, which like we saw is the tensor that tracks the spatial volume changes along curves. In this case, the literal curve of the hyperboloid, the expanding space, it's given by this, where R is the radius of your hyperboloid at any moment in time and n is just your number of dimensions. In this case, we use four dimensions. And following from that, the Ricci scalar, which is a specific contraction of the Ricci tensor, is therefore given by um, n, n minus one over r squared, okay, where r is again your radius. We can then simply just use the Einstein field equations to tell us what our cosmological constant would be for a four-dimensional de Sitter space. We can set the energy momentum tensor equal to zero, of course, like we just did. So everything on the right side goes to zero. Send the constant over to the other side and plug in the values of the Ricci tensor and Ricci scalar, which give us this equation, which reduces to this. Farther still, and we get negative three over R squared equals the negative constant. So just flip the signs and drop the metric here, and we get a cosmological constant value in the center space of three over the curvature radius squared which of course looks similar to what we got in the Friedman equation, although different constants are being used here, obviously. So surely you've heard something similar uh, like this whenever black holes are referenced. 
But the sitter space uh, actually has a horizon. It has a cosmological horizon of which any information emitted past that horizon will never reach you even as T goes to infinity. The area of that horizon is given by uh, 4 pi r squared, okay? Obviously, um, you know, we have the area of a sphere here, okay? And where R, that's where R is again, the radius of the curvature at any moment. It's not a fixed value. It changes over time and is time dependent as seen in this. The curvature radius increases as time goes on as the constant curvature keeps expanding the space. And now remember that cosmological constant is connected to the curvature radius through lambda equals three over R squared. So therefore we can see that the radius itself is actually given by R equals square root three over lambda. But anyway, Stephen Hawking, which was, of course, a huge name when it comes to black holes um, and the research and advancements made in black holes, was able to famously show in 1975 that black holes, in fact, have a temperature. They are not at any absolute zero. More precisely, we can actually treat this as a brute fact that whenever there's a cosmological horizon anywhere in the universe, whenever there's a horizon, there's a temperature as well. This is due to what is believed to be Hawking radiation. Hawking radiation can be thought of as matter-antimatter particle pairs, which are emitted from a black hole and split at the horizon, where one leaves the horizon and one actually stays in. Um, and this causes the black hole to lose mass over time. It loses mass equal to the mass of the particle that it emitted, the particle that is now roaming free. That gives a horizon, a cosmological horizon, that gives it a temperature. But anyways, you're able to show, as Hawking famously did, that the temperature of a black hole, the temperature of a horizon, is K over 2 pi, where K is the uh, surface gravity of the black hole. The surface gravity being given by 1 over 4m. So then we can just see the temperature to be, through keep change flip, 1 over 8m pi, assuming that all of our natural coordinates are set equal to 1. And since the sitter space has a horizon similar to a black hole horizon, it must have a temperature as well. Just like how the black hole horizon has that surface gravity K, the horizon of the sitter space has a surface gravity as well. And it was shown to be a value that should actually look very familiar, K equals lambda over square root of three. So with the actual temperature of the sitter space being given by lambda over two pi times the square root of three. This being shown in 1977, by Gibbons and Hawking. And this is where we get specifically into Boltzmann brains. Since the sitter space has a thermal temperature, since it has a thermal energy, I guess, it must therefore have an entropy. Remember, entropy is just the inability to convert thermal energy into work. So if you have some type of thermal energy in your space, which Gibbons and Hawking just showed that you did, you must therefore have an entropy. And this is what gives Boltzmann brains a leg to stand on. It's because the universe which we will become, which everything will become predicted by the Friedman equations, will have an entropy. And since it has an entropy, there are those chances for those random downward fluctuations. Even when everything has expanded essentially infinitely far away from everything else and the expansion rate has just gotten insane, that empty space that we're left with, that complete void, will still have an entropy given by a naught over four, where a naught is the area of the Sitter horizon given by four pi times the square root of three over lambda, that squared, which reduces to four pi three over lambda, which we can divide by that denominator four, which gives you pi three over lambda. So this is the entropy of the sitter space. Again, that three and that lambda are making steady appearances. That's very cool to see. Now remember, the max entropy of a system is what's known as its thermal equilibrium. It's when there's no more ability for the system to convert energy into work, something like an even distribution of particles in a box of gas. Well, when you look at the sitter space, what the universe will become as T goes to infinity, that looks something like thermal equilibrium. It's a very simple space. There's not much going on. You only have a vacuum energy. So if we take the small leap to say that our de Sitter space is at some maximum entropy value, or at least close to some maximum entropy value, well now what do you have? Well now you have a Boltzmann reconciliation universe. You have a void at some seemingly maximum entropy. Well now random downward fluctuations from thermal equilibrium can occur. 
and as t goes to infinity inf in an infinite timetable these random downward fluctuations will occur like i said it's actually a finite amount of time that it would take for one to occur that's been proven so as time goes to infinity you would get every iteration of every possible you know fluctuation in entropy an infinite amount of times at least that's what you know the philosophy is saying you get boltzmann brains in our universe in our the sitter space for real those would really happen and if you're skeptical about this which i would understand why you would be even i'm skeptical about it um, there's a thought experiment which really helps show what's going on it's the infinite monkey thought experiment maybe you've heard of it maybe you haven't but it essentially says that um you know if you have a monkey that lives forever and if you give him a typewriter that never runs out of ink or paper or anything like that it's a spherical cow example but if everything's infinite, then he will eventually write uh, the complete works of Shakespeare in perfect form. And not only the complete works of Shakespeare, but every possible iteration of every possible um, character on that keyboard, he would write it um, an infinite amount of times. So everything with a non-zero chance, like I mentioned, everything with a, a non-zero chance of happening will occur in an infinite timetable. That's essentially what this is saying with regards to Boltzmann brains entropy is modeled probabilistically so as long as time is infinite we can say that yes for certain there will be Boltzmann brains forming in our universe in the in the very distant future okay these will occur and just to close this out um, we can actually put this into another logical argument this time with three premises what we can do is we can say premise one as predicted by the Friedman equation our universe will form infinite desider regions of space-time as t goes to infinity it it just it looks like that's what's going to happen um, there's a it's there's a lot of talk about the big crunch versus the big rip things like that as of right now it looks like the expansion is not slowing down at all so it looks like bolts uh, so it looks like the center space, excuse me, is in our future. And premise two is the center space has some finite entropy and is or will reach some thermal equilibrium as T goes to infinity. With premise three being random downward fluctuations from some max entropy state are guaranteed to occur an infinite amount of times as T goes to infinity due to the nature of infinity. So following from these, the conclusion would be Boltzmann brains will occur infinitely many times in our universe in the infinite future i'm not saying i agree with it i'm just saying that's what the boltzmann brain argument is that's the nature of all of this i guess all right sweet